Um, we've been here for 13 years and when we arrived here sort of we basically arrived in, at an empty section where there was just grass growing with a few uh, fruit trees and nothing else around it. We just started, but it, there wasn't really a plan to start with, we just you know, started making beds where mm. we thought it would be good to have beds and it's been in a state of flux ever since. So 728 square metres and our house is 90 square metres. A bit more, 95. Being exact. Yeah. <laughs> we had an oversight of what we planted, like we wanted to have trees for the birds and we for shade because we saw excess sun was a problem and we also wanted to have vegetables like we wanted to come out in the garden and get our vegetables and fruit and eat it so being becoming more independent from shops was the aim what we didn't have was we didn't have a clear idea how the section worked and how the sun angles worked and you know what would provide shade and what would um, yeah, what would be shaded in winter so we couldn't grow, so that was the part of the experiment. It takes a while to learn about your soil and the mm. drainage and which bits are sort of a bit loose and which bits get boggy in winter and things like that, so that's part of how it develops. Nice sugar snack peas. <laughs> We have uh, certain preferences which will start in buying locally, buying organically and buying fair trade. And swapping with friends, that's yeah, become big too, trade. that we're just bartering amongst all of us because we all have surpluses, or different surpluses and different specialities. Our chickens, we um, always intrigued about having animals in the around the house and uh, also for Stella when she she was a bit younger we wanted to show her where actually things come from rather than going into shops and buying eggs we thought we decided we will have chickens uh, on our own we seem to almost get by without buying any any eggs during the whole year we have an umbrella group here in Point Chevalier which has different offshoot groups so there's the garden group, which is also now runs a community garden. So there are two working bees a week, which normally sort of attract like between four and six people, and that's a sort of different for four or six people most weeks. Um, and that's organised usually by two or three key people, and um, yeah, jobs are undertaken. So people have laid paths and made beds and planted green crops which was um, very satisfying in terms of just a team of people coming together and making something useful. Because we've got a big garden we need to water over summer so we've tried to mulch as much as possible and put a lot of organic matter into our garden to make it um, retain as much water as possible but Auckland summers are very hot and very dry so you have to water and then it's just it seems I, you know, stupid to be using um, pure water which is shipped in from the Waikato uh, to water our gardens so now we've put in a 5,000 litre tank that's all rainwater collected off our roof because Auckland doesn't have a water shortage in winter so what our plan is um, is that we will run our washing machine and our toilet from our 5,000 litres during the winter and then switch to watering our garden from it. So we'll use the water all year round. And of course in Auckland you pay for the water, so... But I, I, I would say that pay, paying for the water is not the, the only reason or the reason why we are doing this. We just think it is wrong to use uh, drinking water to flush your toilet and to use on the washing machine or to water your garden with drinking water, you know, which has used up a lot of energy to actually come to that stage and come to your water tap in the house. I think, yeah, I, I mean, being involved in designing houses, I think it should be compulsory for every new house 
going up to have a rainwater collection. I, I remember before that uh, we, as soon as there was heavy rain, the runoff from the roofs would just flood and, and then the sewage would run into the harbour. And uh, so it, the appropriate thing to do would be actually to get those first big flushes of rainwater off the roof and get into a holding tank on the, on the house and then use it watering your property. First it was Anne who used to do the walking school bus and now I've been doing walking school bus for about two years. It's a council initiative. What the aim is is that less and less parents will drive their kids to school on the car because it's just been quite dangerous for the kids. And if you are in the suburb and you are less than say two or three kilometers away from your school, it's quite easy to walk. And the way the system works, we have uh, a bus stop uh, from where one of the routes starts and uh, the kids come and they be, they be dropped off by a parent or they come by themselves at, uh, at 10 past 8 in the morning and they know in five minutes time we will start walking down to school and the, the aim is to have one adult supervision for every eight children. So it's usually two parents who walk the children down to school. It's also now we're starting to pick them up at school, after school, and bring them home again to the bus stop. So the metaphor is quite simple. It is like a bus. You have drivers, mm. and of course the kids are the passengers. I mean, you don't get to sit down on our bus. You, yeah. you have to walk. It's also you come to know the children. You talk on the way to the school. Um, you talk to the parents who drop their children off, so it's just a community thing and it's a bit of networking for the, for the supper. In Point Chevalier there's been quite a lot of work done building community through groups like SALT, which is slow in this traffic, and um, also the trans transition town movement, the schools and the churches, they have all all about networking and trying to encourage people not to drive out of the suburb but use local things and to walk and cycle. Um, and I think that's been huge in terms of reducing the community footprint. Um, just getting cars off the road and people talking. Because with that there's also a spread of information. Suddenly we have all these gardeners gardening and people swapping vegetable plants and things like that. So that's, you know, that community aspect is huge. It's, pointless to, to put a solar p a panel on your roof and to put a water tank up somewhere and think you're being sustainable. I mean, um, the tank's going to be rotten in 20 years, the panel will have dropped off. That's not sustainable, it's just using less. Um, I think to build really sustainable and, uh, and resilient communities, you have to talk to people and you have to be networking. So people are quite starved of community. Mm. They're quite, they want to be connected, they want to know their neighbours, feel like they belong. <laughs>